just for this is my my favorite challenge that I throw out to folks that want to talk about cholesterol and or any of the lipoproteins and or any fraction of any of the lipoproteins, whatever, as being the cause. Here it is. When you look at the total area of the endothelium of the vascular tree, all of it, do we find atherosclerotic lesioning developing evenly across the surface of that endothelium? <laughs> Yeah, no, it's only in uh, very discreet areas. Mm -hmm. So is the blood coursing past the rest of the vascular tree in some way different to those particular areas that are developing the lesioning, i.e. does that blood contain a different amount of LDLC or whatever else? Well, I mean, I think really the only thing we could say might be different is the level of oxygen. Uh, I don't sure. think we can say that the lipid, either lipoproteins or, I mean, you know, on the surface of red blood cells, right, there's a lot of cholesterol being free cholesterol, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't offload in the arterial system before it gets to the venous system. It's uh, uh, it's the same in both. That's right. Throughout. And mm -hmm. so we have atherosclerosis, which develop only on one side of the vascular tree and not the other side, only on the high pressure side only in the arterial side. You don't get atherosclerosis developing in veins. Doesn't happen. That's interesting, isn't it? You don't get it? varicose arteries either, right? Correct. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay, there are some structural differences between arteries and veins in terms of, you know, the internal... Well, you have vein. more smooth muscle, right? Exactly, yep. However, you take a vein, let's say, from the leg, and you graft it into a person's heart for a bypass, Hey, presto, that vein, which was clean because it was a vein that was put in there, several months later you can go back, whoops, there's atherosclerosis developing in there now. Mm. Now, do you know, um, because you may have seen, you know, biopsy images of these uh, venous grafts mm. after they were already diseased, did they change their structure to resent, like, did they essentially become phenotypic arteries or did they stay, you know, with a thinner wall in the typical venous structure? Mm. Well, I mean, t to clarify, I, I have seen not just diagrams, images, whatever else. I have stood in theatres and I have been involved in the process of these cases, these interventions being undertaken surgically. I have myself looked at the vein. That's interesting. Hmm. <laughs> yes, good, good. And I have been in, been in there when it's been grafted into a person's heart, and I have also been in that same hospital, in a different theatre perhaps, with that same patient two or three months later when they've had another event that needs grafting. Well, let's have a look at the one we did a few months ago. Oh, look at that. It's not looking like in, in several months that there's any huge change to the structure of that grafted vein. I imagine over time it absolutely would because it would be subject to the pulsatile pressure that it wasn't on the venous when it was doing the venous thing. Right. So you mean just from the mechanical forces, it'll cause uh, muscular hypertrophy and exactly, the, yes. uh, intima? Exactly, yes. That makes sense? Yeah. But uh, uh, what I'm saying is like two or three months later, no, not so much, not, visi not visibly, not just by so standing over the patient and going, hmm. It would be a longer time scale for that to occur if it does. Yes. But also, did do is that three months long enough to develop uh, plaque lesions in the That's in what the I'm venous saying, group? yeah. When, when you do a, a scan of that grafted piece of vein that's now functioning as an artery in the heart, we can go, oh, yeah, look, it's developing. You can see it with ultrasound. Right. Yeah. So what do you think is going on to uh, cause that? Well... Given that, we are, by that kind of logic, we are kind of eliminating things, aren't we? And we're saying, okay, if, we, if we're looking at cause and effect here, all right, if LDL was the cause, then we would get probably even development of atherosclerotic lesioning across the entire inner surface of the endothelial cells in the vascular tree on both the high and low pressure side. Because if the cause is LDL and the blood carries LDL, the same LDL, on both sides of that tree, then that's what you'd get. Okay, we do not see that. That does not occur in veins in the low pressure side of the vasculature. It only occurs on the high pressure side. Ergo, logically, the pressure, the pulsatility of the arterial side, that must be involved causally. That's the thing that's absent on the other side. You think it's like mechanical stresses, turbulence, things like that? Specifically, that's the next point. It, it, then you, you start eliminating, okay, is it the pressure itself? Well, no, because 
then you would, if it was the pressure was the cause, the immediate cause, what you would find is that atherosclerotic lesions would develop more so where the pressure is highest and less where the pressure is lowest. Okay, we actually do see that a bit because but there atherosclerosis be, uh, is, is in the large arteries, not the small ones generally. I mean, that there should be a somewhat of a linear or maybe not linear, but correlative relationship, right, mm. between yeah. the pressures and the at least the volume of plaques. I'm not sure what right. parameter you okay. use so to. We don't see that, and that's not reported in the literature at all. What is reported and what is seen by clinicians looking at these things in both living and folks who are no longer living, because I've done both of those in my career as well. Atherosclerotic plaques occur in very discrete, very distinct regions within the arterial side of the circuit only, and those areas are the areas where turbulent flow occurs in the blood. So like uh, junctions of arterial branches, right, things so you've like got that. Y junctions, you get atherosclerosis there and there. In, say, the, aor the aortic arch, what you're going to find is that the atherosclerotic lesioning is on the underside of the arch, not the upper side, where the turbulent flow occurs according to the laws of fluid dynamics. Looks you like should be able to, to have some kind of measurement of this turbulence, uh, at least with a catheter, right? I think that, that could be done, and I, I'm not aware of it having been done. Maybe with a Doppler ultrasound, you might be able to pick mm. up something. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm just wondering because you could kind of, if you were able to quantify the turbulence in some way, you could compare people with no cardiac disease to cardiac disease and see mm. if you see differences there. Yeah. Uh, but it could also be that the turbulence, you know, may cause some micro trauma, but then there may be some other element that interacts with that in, in some way. Absolutely. And I think it is. I think that the turbulent flow causes irritation and possibly physical damage to those particular endothelial cells in those patches where that turbulence is occurring, that would cause the expression of and the migration of the proteoglycans involved to those patches of tissue. That attracts the LDL-C packages to provide the cholesterol for the repair, in my mind, that's why that's happening. But also, you know, glycation, oxidation would be involved. It's like, I think it's like fire where you need heat, a fuel source, and oxygen. Remove any one and you can't have a fire. Ask any fire. I mean, well, no, this is, I mean, this really makes sense, right? Why, mm. why the specific anatomical location of these lesions, right? right? But then, like you're saying, you know, what, what's required to establish an actual lesion? Because obviously some people get them, other people don't. We right. all have some degree yeah. uh, of turbulence. And I think oxidation is a key because in everything I was able to, you know, read from the mainstream, all, if they, you know, if they went down as far as possible to the root, they always ended with, you know, oxidation. Of course, we know about lipid peroxidation, right? So mm. even some of the native lipids in those lesions are going to be oxidated, but they are not the source of that oxidative potential. So what, you know, what are your thoughts about that? Well, to my way of thinking as a former cardiovascular pathophysiologist, as someone who's looked into this quite a bit, it seems that while there are individual differences, and you've tapped that, you've pointed to that quite correctly, that an average person, all else being equal, the difference between the average person and another average person in terms of turbulence and atherosclerosis would seem to be the most common thing would be blood pressure, chronic hypertension. Because you raise the blood pressure, you necessarily raise the degree of turbulence in those areas that are prone to turbulence if you raise the pressure above where it ought to be. Well, that, that certainly makes sense, but then how would that lead to oxidative damage? Well, the turbulence causes the irritation slash physical damage to those endothelial cells in those patches where the turbulence is occurring. The blood inherently contains quite a bit of oxygen, so the oxygen is delivered up that way. LDL can be retained in that tissue by the proteoglycans that do that, thus exposing it to that oxidative derangement. What the hell, let's throw in some glycation, because the people that have elevated blood pressure chronically are probably the sort of people who eat a bunch of carbohydrates, because what that generally leads to is chronically elevated 
uh, insulin in the blood, hyperinsulinemia, and that causes an inability to excrete sodium effectively, and that re- that leads to increased blood. That, that's what the medical profession call that idiopathic hypertension. It's not idiopathic. There's your explanation. It's insulin because you're eating carbs. That's how I close the circle. What do you think? So, well, so you think that the excess carbohydrate intake is actually the predominant causal factor of hypertension, or you think it? I, yeah, I, I, I think. To result in the oxidative damage. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, certainly we know that excess sugar in the body, right, can increase oxidation. Yes. And uh, that, you know, that could be related to the Randall cycle if it's overwhelmed. And also, obviously, if we have seed oils, we have ox lambs. Yeah. Look, I, so, I, yeah. I think seed oils are the devil. Seed oils have no place in the human diet whatsoever. I, I think they are by far the worst thing we've ever done in human nutrition fields. So absolutely, I'm not exonerating seed oils, polyunsaturated, plant-based things, that, that kind of stuff. But I think still that for the most part, most people with hypertension, you will find an association with the inta- with, a, with a, a large intake of carbohydrate in most of those people. Now, that's obviously, that's not an etiological pathway that will fit every patient. There will be outliers where people that say, well, look, I'm not overweight. I don't eat carbohydrates. Et cetera, et cetera, and here I am with a heart attack. I'm not suggesting that this is a one size fits all. This is the answer for everybody's solution. But I think it's the best one. I think the, the best thing a person can do in terms of reducing their likelihood of heart disease is to stop eating carbohydrates. Well, I certainly have seen the health benefits of low carbohydrate diets. So I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you there. 